up. I got fire power there. Good to have everyone out tonight. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sing the rest of them in. They usually get here promptly at 7.35 or 7.40, so we're going to go right ahead and uh, start the service, and we'll sing them in, we'll have to stop, come and lead us in a song, and uh, get us off the book, and we'll just go to church tonight. You're going to have to really do good tonight if you do as good as you all did last night, all right? So we want you to uh, just mind the Lord, get right into service, and uh, if you don't get help, and you don't... Uh, don't uh, feel the Lord or whatever, then I would say that you didn't want it, okay? Because he's here tonight. So we're glad. I know he's here because I brought him with me. So let's have church tonight. Get you some. Good evening. Turn here to the 212.
Is there anyone here? Yeah. He has been good to. Yeah. Let's give him glory in his house today. Yeah. Is there anyone here? Yeah. So Lord Jesus, is there anyone here? Yeah. Love the Lord Jesus. Thankful that his blood washed your sins away. Yeah. Is there anyone here? He has been good to. Let's give him glory in his house today. In too many churches across this great land, the hot fire of God has grown dim. The worship and praise that used to be common is no longer offered to him. So it's time for the people of God to decide They're going to bring the praise back Is there anyone here who loves the Lord Jesus? He is your Savior and your God is strength Is there anyone here who thinks he is worthy? Lift up your hands and ask his holy Person beside you decides to join in. Don't you worry about what anybody else thinks, because you know how good God has been. Oh, today is a day to break loose from those shackles. Satan is out of the graves. Just look up to heaven and tell the Lord Jesus how. Is there anyone here who loves the Lord Jesus? You're glad that he's conquered heaven and the grave. Is there anyone here who knows that our Savior is the only God who is alive today? Oh, we ought to thank him with all that's within us. Worship him with all our Sing as you go on, God's 
three or four meetings I was in, they were all after I left. Uh, some in the 60s, 60 some say, 30 some say. I just kept going. And uh, I got in one meeting, and this sounds impossible to believe, I know. But uh, by the time I got in the church a half hour early, they had, they had filled up every room, every alleyway with chairs. I know we're live streaming. Where they're at, they don't have a fire marshal anyway. But uh, <laughs> it's so far out, you had to be there to worship, I'll say that. But honestly, they put chairs in every alleyway, every single alleyway. They had one chair out in the middle aisle, and you had to turn sideways to come down the middle aisle, a half hour from the church. They raised the windows of the church. They opened the side doors and the back doors. Put uh, They put patio heaters, cold outside. Put patio heaters outside. People stood on the porch. People stood on the side porch. People stuck their head in the windows. They took the piano and said, no piano tonight. They shoved it against the wall and put more chairs for the elderly to come in and sit. to sing revival. The days of revival are not over. God wants to sing revival. And I'm singing place after place. And uh, so I'll say this to you. Tomorrow night, if you've got your favorite seat, you better be here early. We're believing God to pack this place out. Where's all the shout now? I mean, you ought to go out and tell people, this is so good. When they say, well, what's happened? Say, I can't even tell you. You've got to come see it. And uh, you won't be disappointed. I, I text through to Amber today uh, with the group that will be here tomorrow night. Told them to pray for them. And they are so excited about being with you all. And they're just looking for great things. They love the Lord. They're wonderful people. They're filled with the Spirit of God. And I know you're going to enjoy it. And Brian and Alex, Abby, you did great. Just like I told you, you did great. That's what I did. I enjoyed it one day. They did it one day. Bless my soul. Bless my soul. I got to get to preaching because I'm going to spend time preaching about talking. I want you to turn to the Song of Solomon. And uh, I go a lot to the Old Testament because the Old Testament is it, really you can see the miracles of God as it's unveiled from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is a particular book that is not preached on very often. I'll give you time to find it. Just go to Psalms and keep going through the New Testament. That's probably the easiest way to tell you how to get there. It's a small book. It's not preached on very often. I know it will be preached in this church, but it's not preached in a lot of places. Years ago, God touched my heart about the Song of Solomon. And I started preaching on the on the Song of Solomon, sermons out of it. And when I got into it, I, years ago I prayed this, Lord, before you take me home to heaven, I would like to preach a hundred different sermons out of the Song of Solomon. Now, if I get to 99, Doug, and he decides to call me, I'm still out of here. <laughs> but I am amazed at the messages that God has allowed me to see in the Song of Solomon. Because this is a love relationship. They're courting. Now if you look at this book through natural eyes, it would be wicked in this text. You, you wouldn't understand a lot of things. you put it in the wrong context. You'd see it merely in the physical. But this is not about the physical. It's about the love relationship that the Lord had for His people. And it is also, prophetically speaking, about the love relationship that Jesus has for the bride, the church. So they're in this courting stage. We know, I'm going to read one verse to you. I'll be making reference to several verses. But in Psalm of Solomon, chapter 6, and verse 13, while you turn there. The amazing thing is, Solomon is believed to be one of the wisest men that ever lived besides Christ himself. He's responsible for three books in your Bible. The book of Proverbs, the book of the Song of Solomon, and also uh, he is responsible for Ecclesiastes. He was responsible for, over, according to the Word of God, he was responsible for 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 Psalms. Imagine that. 
thousand proverbs and a thousand and five songs. You say, is that scriptural? First Kings chapter four and verse thirty-two says that it is. And out of all of those songs and proverbs, out of all the songs, he says, this is the one. This is the song of songs. In other words, this is the best that he wrote right here. Doesn't get better than this. It doesn't get sweeter than this. Out of a thousand and five songs, this is the best song that he wrote. And it's about this love relationship that he has. By the time we get to verse 13 of chapter 6, and I'll try to explain as quickly as I can about these about these women of Jerusalem and what, what they're crying out here. Uh, they, they have ridiculed this Shunammite to begin with. And as they have ridiculed her, they have ridiculed her merely because she had been somewhere else and come back and they despised her. You know people will despise you for being with the king. They'll just hate you because you love Jesus. And now she's come back. But suddenly she has disappeared. And they are missing her beauty. They are missing what she offered to them. Will anybody miss you when you're gone? I mean, will they say, Oh, thank you Lord. More meetings will be better. <laughs> or will they say, and this is the truth. When I came in and made my way to the front, I went over to Lola, shook her hand, felt the presence of God, and I said, we're having church tonight. Yeah. Well, they said, thank God they're here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have meeting tonight. Because you know well enough, if nobody else has church, they're going to have church. What will they say about you? They'll say, I miss that beauty. I, I miss that spirit. There's something that's not there. So they start to cry out in verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will you see in the Shulamite? And that's my question. What will we see in the Shulamite tonight? Well, that's a big word, but what does it mean? Well, Shulamite is the feminine word for Solomon. They are not married yet, but this bride-to-be has taken on his name before they're married. I don't want to lose you in the middle of all this. See, that's what we are. We've not had the wedding yet. The wedding supper is yet to come. But you know what? When we fall in love with Him and we accept Him and realize how much that He loves us, our relationship is so we already take on His name before we ever get married. Now when Candy married me, I know young people, this is old school, but when she married me, she changed her name to my name. I like my name so well, I kept it. But she changed her last name to my last name. And what he's saying is, she changed her name before the wedding. You know something? Before there's ever a wedding, I've already taken on his name. I say proudly, I am a Christian. I have taken on his name. He is the love of my life. And as the love of our life, we take on his name and realize for with each growing day how much that he loves us. But who is this Shulamite? To be a Shulamite means that she came from a place called Shul. Can I just tell you, maybe in five minutes, if you'll allow me just to put it in country preacher lay terms, a little account of what happened here with this Shulamite. Her name is not specifically mentioned in the Song of Song. But I believe I believe the Shulamite is Abishag. You'll read about Abishag in 1 Kings chapters 1 and a little in chapter 2, but focused in chapter 1. She's from Shunem. Shunem is the lower portion of Galilee, and there in the lower portion of Galilee, David and then Solomon, they had orchards 
They had farms. They had vineyards. And they had flocks of sheep. Now since they are in Jerusalem, and that's in the lower part of Galilee, they needed all of that because with the city of Jerusalem, the population was so great, and the land right around Jerusalem couldn't support them agriculturally, so they went to this lower portion of Galilee, and they found this fertile land, and they started, they started investing in that land, David first, then Solomon. And it was so fertile that it would grow in abundance in that area. The, the population wasn't very large. But here they are in Jerusalem, and here all of the goods are down in Lower Galilee. So what do we do? They can't be the king in Jerusalem and be in Lower Galilee too. They can't farm and be the king at the same time. So what they do, they take the local people and they say, I'm going to make a lease agreement with you. And this is what we'll do. You raise these crops. You tend to these vineyards. You take care of these sheep. And what I'll do as the king, I will pay you and you'll get all you want to eat. You'll get your portion of the goods that you've raised. You'll have plenty to eat. I'll take care of you. You'll never have a need. You'll never have a need. I'll take care of you as your king. You won't have to worry about anything. I'll give it all to you and take care of you. This was the environment that she was raised in. She was the daughter of one of those in that shepherd area that took care of the sheep and the vineyards and the fields. But they have come and taken her somewhat by force. They've taken her to be a concubine of David. They bring her into the king's court. Now she's a concubine of David, but that's where I, I think. I hate what this society has become. They are so filthy minded and so worldly minded that they can't read. I actually heard a, a contemporary preacher. I'm not talking about contemporary type of service. I'm just talking about modern day preacher. I actually heard a modern day preacher talk about this and basically presented her like she was a harlot. And that's not true. We hear the word concubine and we automatically think of the physical. She never had a physical relationship with King David. Well, how do you know that? Because in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 4 said that David knew her not. Do you know what that means? By the way, the reason that they had brought her in, you remember David was getting old, and we don't know what it was. I personally feel like he probably had some type of a heart problem or circulation problem. The Bible says that he got no heat. And what that simply means is that he stayed cold. I understand that. I dealt with a blood condition for 30 years. And I'm on blood thinner, been on 30 years. And I stay cold. While you all were sweating, I never sweated a drop tonight. I stay cold all the time. And that's just part of it. And can you say I sweat it? Not very often. I stay cold. And for any of you that's on that, you understand that. Well, it had affected his circulation. Well, they didn't have they didn't have medication. They didn't have heated blankets. They didn't have all the conveniences we had. So they realized that body heat was the best way for him to be warmed up. So they took this young lady, put her in the bed with King David. And I've heard that preached wrongfully so many times that I've heard him say, well, David wasn't interested in a female in his bed, so he had to be near death. They had nothing to do with it. They were trying to medically take care of the king that they loved. I am still preaching. And the Bible makes it clear there was never a physical relationship between Abishag and David. Another reason I know that is what's known in history as, as the law of the kings. Because later, Solomon marries Abishag. And he could not have married Abishag by the law of the kings. It would have been illegal if he would have married her had she been the wife of his father. Kings were allowed to do that. So when they realized David is dying, and he does die. They have to bring on the next king. Adonijah came wanting to be the king, but he wasn't in line to be the king. He was trying to get the blessing of being the king to stay.
step in in front of Saul. And when, when he realized from the prophet that he was not going to be the next king, Solomon was, he goes around Solomon to his mother. And he says, every good boy will listen to mama. Yeah, right. So he goes to his mother and says, there's one thing Adonijah says that I want. I want Abishak to be my wife. But by this time, Solomon had caught wind of it. And he said, should I give him my kingdom also? See, really, what was a trick? It was a trick. He didn't want Abishag. He knew that with her being a concubine, if he married her, that would put him first in line to be king because he would be married to the concubine of the king that had died. So it was a political move. Hadn't changed much, has it? He's maneuvering to try to get what he wants. He's trying to work the man of God for his own benefit and for what he can get. Well, Abishag was returned back to her home country in Shudah. Now hold on, I know some of you have a hard time. It's Monday night, we've got to think. But if I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach. If we, we said we want to go to the next level, only way you can go to the next level, you got to go deeper to go up. That's right. Praise goes up, answers come back. So here we are. Her now in Shunem, Solomon is in Jerusalem. During that time, she had caught the eye of Solomon. Solomon loved her, and Solomon wanted to marry her. But Solomon had a problem. She's now in Shunem. And he's in Jerusalem. And he's got a bigger problem. Do you know that people will lie to you if they think you have money? You don't believe that? You'll find out if you are ever blessed in some way, some strange way that you come in to an abundance of money, you'll find cousins coming to your house that you've never seen in your life. Help me preach that. So Solomon knows the nature of people. He's a wise man. Will she marry me because she loves me? I don't want a wife that doesn't love me. Let me stop right here. The Lord Jesus Christ only wants one thing from you. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your popularity. He doesn't want your wisdom. You know, you can't tell him anything you don't already know. You can't give him anything that he don't already that he don't already have. He has all he knows at all. And he's saying, the only thing I want from you is for you to love me for who I am. So now, he devises a plan. She's in a far country. So he leaves the whole big city. Oh, I feel preaching coming home. And he says, this is what I'll do. I'm going to go down to shoot him, and I'm going to dress up like a shepherd. And what I'm going to do as a shepherd, I'll disguise myself so that she won't see me as the king. She'll see me as one of her own. she's at. I mean, I want to get just close enough to her till she can get a little glimpse of me. Here and there. One night she's laying in the bed and she said, I saw it with the keyhole. But when I got there, by the time I got there, I saw him who my soul loved, but I found him not. I said, I'm going to rise and go down the street and find him who my soul loved. 
Yeah. He keeps getting glimpses of it. But he doesn't reveal himself to me. He would even leave his fragrance behind. And just she got so close, she couldn't see him, but she could smell him saying, I don't see him, but he's passed this way. <laughs> see, he was a shepherd. You know about shepherds, don't you? Shepherds have what's called wadding. You know what wadding is? They have their own blend of spices, almost like a perfume. Every shepherd has a different blend. It's passed down from father to son. And in that wadding, if you could imagine, if I would put something similar to a mixture of potpourri in this, and instead of this just being one cloth wadded up in a bowl, if I would have strips and tie it around until it's about the size of a baseball and it has those spices inside of it, what the shepherd would do is the shepherd realized that the sheep were close to him and he would oftentimes have that wadding down in his side pouch and he would pull the old ram up or the new up beside it and rub their nose up against it to let them get a good smell of what he smells like. You know why he did that? Because there was times that he wanted the sheep to follow him by his fragrance. You read the Bible how Jesus, his halo, his fur, his fragrance that is there, he's always used his strength, whether it be in the incense or the holy morning oil. Can I say this to you? Nobody smells like Jesus smells. He's not a friend that's on his own. I was in the Holy Land with a group one time. We had 77, I think it was, in that group. And we were, had a couple of buses. And we came down. I uh, know Mark and Debbie's been there many times. You come down from uh, down by the, 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 it's called the Chapel of Tears. That's the place that Jesus overlooked the Kidron Valley. You're just outside the eastern gate of Rome Gate. And that goes down into the valley, down the bottom of the valley. It's the Garden of Gethsemane there in that Kidron Valley. And that shepherd, you have to be there to believe this. The traffic is unbelievable in the car. I mean, the cars are back and forth. And, and you're there with the group. And you see this shepherd come with all these sheep behind him. And you think, how is he going to get those sheep to the other side? And you know what he does? He takes his body out, grabs that old you, and he rubs it under its nose. He takes that body over to another one, rubs it under its nose. And then he takes that body and he threw it across the street. They got a whiff of the shepherd going that way. So do you know what they did? Started in the road. In the meantime, the shepherd stepped out in front of all the cars and stood, staring in hand. Every car stopped for the shepherd. And the sheep made it safely to the other side. I don't always see, but I can smell when he passes by. There's nothing like the presence of the Almighty God. Now she keeps getting glimpses of it. She says, it's strange what she says. She says, I am as black as the tents of Gadar. And I am as comely, that means as beautiful, as the curtains of Solomon. She had been in the king's palace. And she's on the outside. As the others look at me, now the tents of Kadar, they were black, they were goat's hide, they traveled with bellums, and they were dirty on the outside, filthy. She said, I'm as dirty as those tents of Kadar on the outside to these other people because they look at me, they look at me like I come from a life of being a harlot and they reject me, they turn me away. She said, but on the inside, I've been in the palace of the king and if only the king would come to where I'm at. He sees inside of me and he knows my heart and he thinks I'm beautiful on the inside. 
you preach this? Those women that talked about it never missed her till she was gone. And they didn't know she was coming back. Let me tell you something. God's been good to this church. He's been good to really good. Good to a lot of churches I go into. He wants to be good to every church. It's just some people don't want that. But as good as what God has been, I'm telling you, if He leaves, if He leaves us, we're going to start crying out. Return. 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 You know what we're looking for? We're looking for a generation that will start saying, God, do it again. Amen. Do it again. Yeah. Do it again. Yeah. Great to see all that. Oh, you don't even know what all that is up there, don't you? They told you the story, haven't they? You all tell them regularly, don't you? They used to have some powerful healing service on Saturday night, I believe it was. And now it's too easy to go to the doctor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For saying that. But you didn't have anything but God back then. Right. He didn't heal you. You were done. Right. You're on your way to heaven if you didn't touch your body. You didn't have money in the bank. And you didn't have a doctor to go to. But they knew the great physician. Yeah. And they knew how to pray. They weren't the healer. He was the healer. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't you all like to see a few more of them pigs down that wall? Return. 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 Some of, some of you older folks here at the church, and I'm not putting you on the spot, just if you remember, and I understand if you don't. I do. I understand that Bob's with me tonight. Bob, you're 89, is that right? 89, I told you, eight. Sorry about that. Uh, he's 89. He tells me all the time they don't get better with age. <laughs> you keep forgetting more and more. And I know you can't remember everything. What's the greatest number that any of you in this church can remember that was saved in a single service here in this church? 21? 21 saved in one service. I don't doubt it, Mark. Can we have 22? 23? How long has it been since you had 21 saved in service? Return. Oh God, come to us like that again. Come back to us, Lord. I'm not saying you're out here sinning and, and looking down on the church and that you're not doing anything and you're not praying. No, this is different. You see, there's sometimes, there's sometimes that you get hungry and you just crave everything. Everything looks good. What do you want to eat? Just point your finger, I'll eat that. But there's other times. There's certain things that nothing else will satisfy you in that. That's why I'm saying that. We ought to say, God, we pray such a divine intervention that, that we want to see souls saved like we've never seen souls saved before. Lord, we go out in the highways and byways and the them to come in. And we're saying to you, Lord, return. I'm in overtime. I never preach this long anymore. It's your fault. I'm going to close with this. The world is praying to see something from the church that is real and genuine. You see the mentality of the world, and I'm not being critical about this. God sent Asbury to revive. I don't care what you think of it or don't think of it. I'm good. God sent Asbury to revive. And it sparked. I, I was down in North Carolina in a meeting at a liberal college five minutes away from where the revival was. They came to the revival, some of the students. They went back to chapel. They started praying. Thirty some hours later, when I left, they were still in the chapel praying. They had 25 saved in one night. 
That revival started sweeping everywhere. Did you see the response? We can't have revival. We gotta get these kids back in class. Too much traffic in our town. That's what happens. I talked to a preacher the other day, and he said, Preacher, God's poured it on, but I've never had a battle like I've had. I said, What is it? He said, Somebody actually scolded me because they couldn't get their seat. Take my seat. I'll stand up. You come. We'll make room for you. Return. 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 Hey. All the people living in fear after COVID. Return. 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 He said, it's the truth. I know you're true. I know you respect me. But also, God is being I hate to think that I let one guy to stand between me and me with God's people. I know fear is real, but I know also fear is a spirit. And sometimes you got to say, God, return. It's not going to happen till we ask you. Can I see you? Jesus, can I, can I see you? Just for a minute. Can I see you? Lord, I want you to come back. And it will come with more power than we ever experienced. I singled out the young people last night. Listen, listen. We need you. We need your mind. We need your strength. We need your talents. We need you. Don't put anything before God and church. We need you. I know it's a heavy one. And I know you pulled from all sides. But we need you right now in this generation. To see souls saved and lives changed. How many young people, how many of you have a friend that you know personally that is lost that needs Jesus? Hear that. Hear that. I see one of you. Raise your hand back up here. One of you. Thank you. Thank you. 27 can be saved tomorrow night. Did you say 21? Is that what I heard? 27 to be saved. If you just get your friends to come, you say, well, how do you know that when you say? If they get a glimpse of him and he's here, I see him. He's here in these services. He's here in these people. They get a glimpse of him. They'll say, hey, I'm not fighting what I need in this world. I need something better and something that's real. And he is Jesus. So can I close with this? I love you, Jesus. She felt so unworthy. Why would a king love her? They talked about it. They abused her. Why would a king love her? And the king said, because they don't see your heart. They don't see the beauty on the inside. And the king can say to us, I made you, and I know what you can do. And I know what the Lord can do through you. Anybody else here love you? I mean, don't look around. Look up to him and tell him you love him. Disguised as one of us. So that we'll never be able to say, Lord, you don't understand. He does understand. I don't know who you have to sing, Tom, but you all sing it, Brian. You come right on. I'm telling you, we ought to crave a return of God. They're coming to sing. Your heads are bowed throughout the sanctuary. Heads are bowed and people are praying. 
No one's looking on. If you're here as a believer and you'd like to personally experience a revival, a mighty stirring, you'd like to see that. Nobody's looking on, so don't be embarrassed. You'd like to see that personally in your heart. You raise your hand right now and say, yes, I would. Hold your hand up. Hold your hand up high. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. I, I'd love to sense the closeness of the Lord as never before. How many of you right now got your hand up will just come up here to these altars and keep your hands up and tell him how much you love him. Say, please return, Lord. You raise your hand. Just get up right now and come. That's it. Come, come. Front to back. Front to back. You come, you come right on. Come right on. Come right on. If you can't do it, you stand. It's fine. You, you tell him how you want to tell him. Young person, mom, man. How many of you, while they're coming, you're here tonight and you've got unconfessed sin in your life. If you're here tonight with unconfessed sin in your life, I'm not about to tell you this is the answer, but you've got to start somewhere. If you have unconfessed sin in your life and you say, preacher, I need, I need to get this right with God. Some of you have strayed from God and you need to return. 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 Return! Maybe you'd raise your hand right now just like those others and I'd just recognize you raise your hand and you'd say, Preacher, I know it's not the answer, but I'll never get it right with God when I realize I need to get it right with God. I'm not where I should be with Him and I know that. I want you to pray for me, Cal. I want you to pray. I'm not going to call out your name. God bless you. Somebody else just raise your hand right now. Young, old, and life, all over the century, raise your hand right now. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Christians are here praying. It do you good to come and pray for your lost loved ones. God bless you for this stand and go sing. And whether you raise your hand or not, don't wait. Right on the very first verse. Will you just come out of your seat? Will you come right now? Meet the Lord here. Oh, what a wonderful time. Tell him how much you love him. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. You. I'm telling you, when you start telling you love him, there's something that happens on the inside. Father, I wonder why I had to live such a hard life as one of your children I have passed. Shouldn't things be better for me? Jesus. So many valleys. Well. Too many hills I thought But I was wrong Father I cannot see That you Do not